Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Um, good afternoon. I'm very honoured to be invited to speak to you today. Um, so I, I would like to talk about the place of research data in chemistry, how we've explored this alongside our publishing activities and our community, and some of my views and our views uh, on the future. Um, I started off with this slide about what is research data. Um, and it's interesting to me, having worked in this for a number of years, that it's a question I have to address every time I have a, a conversation about research data. And I think it's it's an Im important one to think about, um, especially from individual fields, because it, it can create a gap in understanding between funders, publishers, researchers, and their institutions. Um, and in some fields, this this can be relatively clear. What's a research? What's research data and a data set, and how that links to the publication? Um, so here, I, I gave as an example in a, a clinical field, a clinical setting, where the clinical outcomes for patients, you know, the collection of that is the data, and the conclusions derived from it uh, are separate. But it's not always the case in chemistry and in other fields as well. There's quite a large overlap between the paper and the data that was built up to inform those those conclusions. Um, and so there are some questions about what, what that data is. Um, in, as an example for synthetic chemistry, much of that data is about observation of what went on, um, what a reaction does, the color of the resulting compound. Uh, the, yeah, much much of this data and, uh, and others as well are, are pictures, or pictures of of data. Our normal practice for chemists is often to include a picture of a spectrum to characterise a material. Um, yeah, and so is a, a structure of a compound data. Um, in chemistry, much of the data comparatively is is relatively small scale and research is, is carried out on single systems. Um, chemists can run 10 different techniques to create one data point, um, whereas biomedical researchers may use one technique on thousands of patients. So how to capture the research in a standard format suitable for use is, is often the center of attention and it's, it's what I spend a lot of my time on. Um, but questions like this, this, this split of what's data is a important one for the community to address. Um, and again, I'll, I'll start off, I have some history of, of chemistry. This is not necessarily um, a groundbreaking in the, uh, the, the terms of data publication, but it's useful to cover. Uh, the history is that our supplementary information has tended to be what the researchers call the data. Um, every chemistry publisher links very well with the um, crystallographic stru uh, Cambridge Structural Database run by CCDC, which is the, um, you know, that's that's the gold standard for data publication in chemistry. But the in practice, most of this supplementary information grew up from taking out the uh, experimental information, the results, the characterization from the paper to reduce the article length. And that's, uh, and as a result, it looks very much like uh, bits of the article that have been left over. Um, so it, it does, it looks like a paper itself. Um, 90% probably of the data, structured data that's published in chemistry is linking to crystallographic, uh, is linking, is the crystallography linking to CCDC. Um, and that itself is a well curated do domain data repository with a history and a focused mission as its, its, you know, sustainability, uh, in hand. And it, it's been around for decades. But in, in terms of, where we are as chemistry publishers. All chemistry publishers, I think, encourage data sharing and point to the few structured data repositories that there are um, and, and also adopt data citation practices. But in outside of crystallography for the researcher, the, the practice isn't, isn't common. So 
you know, for ninety percent of the data that is published, we have this line at the bottom saying you can find the crystal data uh, at the CSD. And it's useful to to explore why this is. Um, so I'll, I'll just say a bit about the history of chemical information to help explain why that is. Chemistry, as we know, has, has been around a long time, and it's it's also heavily commercialized in terms of the intellectual property that people are exploring and the applications. So there's been an active market in chemical information that includes the data. Um, yeah, and this is a very mature market. And these, this spread outside of things which just cover chemistry to be wider scientific information, uh, you know, wider published information uh, across, yeah, across the information landscape. And while this is a barrier in terms of cost in, to people accessing the data, when we speak to researchers, it, it also reduces their incentive to make that data available. Because although it is available at a, a price, it is at least available and it's, it's you know, in a, a large, to a large extent, this is accepted practice. People know that if they don't spend the effort making their data available, some of it will, will actually turn out, you know, people will collect it and curate it and make it available as a cost. So while there are definitely dark areas where data isn't published, say reactions which are unsuccessful or don't have the result that was originally intended, there is a large amount of the of chemistry data and chemistry data information that, that does become available and this this does reduce those um, uh, some of those incentives for researchers to put in the extra effort to do so. Um, the data pyramid, th this has been adapted from, I think, at least uh, one STM, uh, uh, EFCA, who will speak to you later, so publications around chemistry data. But just to show from, there, there are several types of data that we tend to talk about. Right at the bottom, the raw scientific data that comes off the instruments. Um, this is processed, put into publication, standardized and validated in those few databases that do exist. Um, and the value of this information as it goes up, up the pyramid um, increases a lot and, and becomes clearer as you, you make decisions all the way about what you publish, what you standardize and validate, what you might use to generate um, systems that might predict what your reactions will do. Um, but also one of the big challenges is down at that bottom bit, working out where the value is, what's what's worth keeping and what's worth putting in the effort to better structure, to then capture and keep for wider reuse. Um, so I'll also now go on to talk a bit about context of uh, FAIR data, which I'm sure will have come up a lot during the course of today. Um, because in, in my mind, I split these qualities of having open, accessible, reusable data into two bits, the, the findable and accessible, and then the interoperable and reusable as being two different things. Because I think actually there's there's been a huge am, a, amount of work done at the findable and accessible piece to, alert, to create those data publication standards to allow data to be published, made accessible, and for links to be made between data repositories and the publications in which the data is used. So Matt from you know, DataSite have been a, a large part of that, Crossref in building that original Scholix network to be able to link together data identifiers, publications, uh, and to build on those links to generate other insight from the, the data that's published. So actually, once you have data that is is ready to be there to be published, um, there's now you know, there's a, a huge amount of really well understood work to enable publishers and authors to key into that. But for chemistry, um, findable and accessible can take a, a, a few additional, can, can have a few additional meanings. Um, I've taken this from the, the GoFair Chemistry Implementation Network, but there are questions around standard representations around chemistry, 
how the data is processed to make it comparable, um, the availability of, of the data and where the data overlaps with information where it's there in text. Some of the data is proprietary and some of it, as I've, I've said, is there in closed systems, which you know com commercially available. Um, and for me, particularly from chemistry, the interoperability and reusability is, is one of the key bits that we need to look for in the future. Um, to make, have data that's published, which you can then build on to create better science in the future, to have stuff which you can, which has a context around it and you know what can be used, I think is, is one of the, the key questions for people in different fields to be able to address and solve because how to build those standards where, where you start to do that and creating some of those incentives for researchers to be able to help them create data to become more usable um, I think is the, is the key thing from a field. Um, funder policies um, this is this is a current uh, from the, the major funder in the UK but I think this is a similar funding statement which would apply across uh, across Europe and, and expanding beyond that um, so from from 2016 this says that data's uh, researchers should make their data available openly um, but doesn't say what that data should be it's up to the domain the field the researchers themselves to make that decision about what data to keep and what's important and how it should be formatted and, and distributed. So there's definitely a, a move uh, which in, to for researchers and institutions for this to be preserved and made available through institutional repositories. Um, and that's very effective for the, which again can key into the uh, DOIs and persistent IDs to link the data, to make the data discoverable findable and accessible um, but the date that proves to be very effective at an article level so you can get the supporting level to validate an article um, but doesn't tend to address doesn't address at all really the interoperability and future reusability of that data so that, that's the current the current funder um, expectations that, that are put upon uh, researchers in the UK um, there is a UK national data strategy which is in development now. Um, this is uh, under currently under consultation um, and this, this covers go government open data um, but also has a section on scientific research and I think as in a, a number of cases there's lots of data sharing instances around the coronavirus um, pandemic Blockers are identified to data sharing um, and pharma and life science industries are identified as uh, having examples where they found barriers to data accessibility. Um, so particularly in these highlighted bits, there are things around time to access data, constraints for commercial users, cost of data itself. Um, but this is quite interesting as a, using a, a life science uh, example, which may be around accessing of large scale patient data, for example, for pharma and life science organizations to then try and match this um, policy to the costs and the constraints and the incentives around publishing data in lots of other domains which might not quite be the same as, um, uh, as a clinical setting. So what's needed to store and curate this data in a usable form who, who would cover the costs and to go back to what the community wants and need from, an, from the Royal Society of Chemistry's point of view um, I'll just cover a few of the, the ways that we go to try and explore what that future might be what from what the science might need. So as a society, we can probe the scientific need through <clears throat> some of our policy initiatives and then try and place the future importance of data within that. Um, so as part of our research and innovation activities, 
Um, we've explored where the science is going and, and Science Horizons published in 2019 covered blue sky research applications and the associated techniques. <clears throat> and within that, I won't go through this, this slide, but data and digital were shown to be quite at the heart of applications and um, blue sky research, um, but also the, the analytical techniques within that. So we wanted to explore more where that data, where the, the future of data was in terms of the scientific need. So we wanted to ask some more questions about every week we can say lots of nice things about the transformative possibilities of data but how can we really explore further to give concrete examples and to illustrate the range of activities across funders societies institutions researchers that would actually be needed so we then needed to to look at what could actually be achieved um, and our digital futures report tried to show this um, this was launched in July this year, and I recommend you um, take a look at this on our, our website if you're able to. But this, we had a, a wide set of interviews and a strategic advisory forum for a, a number of thought leaders to explore what could be achieved um, and what's required um, as a white paper to give to government funders, but also to give, you know, to talk to our community about what was important to them. There are a number of quotes here about the, the means by which, how data and digital would be likely to transform um, science in the future. The, the report covers uh, overlaps in training and, you know, uh, the importance of data science, but also a key bit there was for the data piece, the, the piece I've highlighted in red here, this incentives for data sharing, development of the standards and formats and availability of the infrastructure tools and skills for the curation and use of these high quality data sets. Uh, and there's, there's lots in this report and I, I do recommend you taking a look if you're, you're able to. So from the RSE's point of view, um, some of the things that we've been involved in, um, I'll talk briefly about some of these. ChemSpider as a collection of, of open structures. Um, we've used that to try and explore um, some of the incentives for publishing chemistry, uh, you know, chemical compounds um, alongside publications into an open space and the willingness of people to be able to do that alongside their publications. With ChemArchive, we've partnered with the other major chemical societies, including the Chemical Society of Japan on the, this preprint server to allow more experimentation of data submission along preprints. And again, that's, it's important to highlight there to where you'd, we're doing stuff on a field basis to be able to do it um, in a way that's across the domain rather than just one society or publisher <clears throat> doing it themselves. It's important where the community are, do want to publish types of data to be able to do that in all the relevant publications. And this um, a, a poster here for Fair for Chemistry, which I know is, is too small to read, but it's just there to illustrate the range of activities around standards development and workflows covering the Research Data Alliance, whereas the Chemistry Research Data Interest Group, um, uh, the GoFair Chemistry Implementation Network, IUPAC as our standards body working on chemical standards, <clears throat> and then supporting organisations like the Pistoia Alliance, um, the INSHI Trust, which I'm particularly involved in, in the development of the INSHI standard, and supporting organisations around there. So there's there's a, an awful lot of uh, of activity going on in trying to build some of those standards and chemistry specific techniques. The thing that we, we also have to be aware of is just the data collection and processing of it. We can sometimes assume with the publication that the data is there to be processed as you know, ready to be processed if only there was a button to be pressed. But a lot of this data needs a lot of work to get it into a publishable form. Um, and also it shouldn't be forgotten that standards develop with a mature field. 
So where people are working in a, a cutting edge area of science, standards won't exist because people are trying stuff out and doing new things and stretching the boundaries. So there is there is definitely the, the trade off there between what, what is achievable um, and what can be what 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 is something that can be usefully developed in the short term. In terms of the repositories, I mentioned this earlier on. In terms, you know, there are general repositories which people can put any types of data in, um, whether they're fig shares and ODO institutional repositories like Apollo at the University of Cambridge. But then the domain repositories, those which curate data collections uh, of specific types of data, there is a real trade off between the, the wide applicability of general repositories where you can put everything in and the domain repositories where you put different types of data in and you if you're publishing a piece of work you may need to use several of these um, and I think we also need to kind of solve that from a, a usability barrier for authors. From our in terms of our um, data activities we're considering data availability statements to go in um looking at the experience of other publishers it you know these need to be mandated for people to do anything um and so how we'd best do this in a way that um adds to the quality of the research we're publishing we're, we're examining um we add data citations where they uh, the authors submit them but those author incentives are lacking so as an organization we have a number of uh, ways that we can try and highlight what some of those incentives might be needed uh, and also for subject opportunities where specific things will be needed by specific parts of the community when i said what people value most they you know, there will be it will be the community that decide what data is most useful to share to build help them build on future research um i would say as, as advice for preparing for open data from society point of view find out what's important for your community the findable and accessible bits are relatively solved i think and there's a, a, a tremendous infrastructure there for for people to be able to join and make their research uh, linked to publications where they're, they're uh, able to do that but some of the interoperable and reusability questions as to how to make some of this data more useful for the future to uh, aggregate um, and use to build future research on is, is a real question. Um, and just to end from my point of view, what I think what we're aiming for is machine readable chemical information. So this this does extend out of data to be uh, to cover information across the board um, because although not all information will be will be used by machine the qualities that machines will need to understand data are just as applicable for humans to use to be able to judge the quality of data so having structured information have the right context and metadata around it to be able to understand what the data is and where it's come from and to have that bias as far as possible towards fair data that is being published that sounds like a good uh, target for us all to aim for so that's my um, pitch for where I would like the Royal Society of Chemistry to go with chemistry data um, I hope that's been useful and I'd be delighted to answer out any questions thank you <laughs>